interactions in the coming years. I now invite Professor Spenta Vadia, who is member of the Committee on International Affairs of APS, founding director of ICTS TIFR and Emeritus Professor TIFR to introduce today's speaker. I must also add that uh, Professor Spenta has been mainly responsible in making today's event happen and really thanks to him for getting this going. So, Professor Spenta. Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mandana. I was about to thank you and Amy for enabling this interaction <laughs> event of IPA and APS. And hopefully it is the beginning of a long overdue coming together of these two organizations and in the future, we hope to see joint activities which will benefit both. I'm also very grateful to Subir Sajde for agreeing to participate and deliver a lecture in this joint APS IPA event on the occasion of 50 years of IPA. And before we begin with his lecture, I would like to introduce him and it's a pleasure and privilege to do so. <clears throat> Subir is a condensed matter physicist uh, who has made pioneering contributions in unraveling the fundamental role of quantum entanglement in understanding novel phases of matter. He's also one of the pioneers of the study of complex systems near quantum phase transitions. His book, Quantum Phase Transitions, is the basic textbook in the field. Besides seminal contributions to condensed matter physics, <clears throat> so we boldly ventured out to work in the exciting string theory subject called the ADS-CFT correspondence, in which the mean field of a strongly coupled many particle system is described by Einstein's theory of gravitation in one higher dimension. His work on a model system of disordered spins became a soluble toy model to study the properties of black holes. This is the celebrated Suchdev E. Kitayev model, which was complex enough to exhibit chaotic behavior similar to what is observed in the presence of black holes. String theorists were searching for such a soluble, instructive model for many decades since the early 1990s. That's amazing. Subir did his schooling at St. Xavier's College in Bangalore. His Bachelor of Science degree in physics is from MIT and his PhD is from Harvard University in 1985. After his postdoc at Bell Labs, he moved to the faculty of Yale University and in 2005 joined the faculty of Harvard University where he is presently the Herschel Smith Professor of Physics. Subir is an outstanding teacher, mentor, and community builder. His students include Kedar Damle, who is a professor at TIFR, Todadri Senthil, Anatoly Polkovnikov, Miltitsky, and more recently, Avishkar Patel, and many others. His postdocs include Pierre Dosal, Satya Majumda, whom we all know, Sean Hartnell, Krishnendu Sen Gupta, Brian Swingle, and many others. The list is quite impressive. And in fact, I have left out a large, large number of outstanding physicists whom Subir, whose lives, professional lives Subir has touched. His academic recognitions among many include the ICTP Dirac Medal, the Onsaga Prize of the American Physical Society, Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, and I must mention Lifetime Achievement Award of St. Jo Joseph's High School in Bangalore. He's an elected member of the US National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Indian Academy of Sciences, and the Indian National Science Academy. Subir has strong links with the science community in India. He held the Dr. Humi Baba chair at TIFR from 2016 for about three years. My own acquaintance with him began when his students Kedar Damle and Todadri Senthil helped organize the first ICTS TIFR program on correlated electrons and frustrated magnetism in November 2007 in Goa. 
on the way back to Mumbai from Goa, I asked Subir whether he would like to serve on the International Advisory Board of the ICTS. He readily agreed. We still benefit from his advice, encouragement, and his many visits to the ICTS. I hope he will continue to engage actively with the Indian science community also in the years to come. And with those few words, I'd like to invite Subir to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me uh, and you can see my pointer. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Professor Wadia or Spenta for that uh, very kind and warm introduction. Uh, it really touched me and I'm uh, very grateful for it. Uh, I think you were the first person to mention in, the, in a physics talk my, my lifetime achievement of, award from my, from my school in Bangalore. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's uh, I find that uh, that means a lot to me and perhaps maybe even some of my classmates are listening. Um, okay, so on to the, the physics talk. So as Pentra mentioned, uh, I've, I've worked on quantum entanglement, uh, mostly in its application to uh, certain quantum materials, which are superconducting. Uh, but over the years, it has acquired uh, some significance also in the study of black holes. So let me begin by oops, uh, um, by just, just defining what's quantum entanglement. So this is an article from 2015 in the New York Times where uh, it refers to spooky action. Uh, so there's a story that Einstein called uh, uh, quantum entanglement, a feature of quantum mechanics, spooky action at a distance, uh, somewhat derisively, uh, because uh, it was clear from his publication that he didn't believe that this was the final answer and there would be something else that would replace this rather bizarre feature. Uh, the bizarre feature being that objects separated by a great distance can instantaneously affect each other's behavior. Uh, so this was around 1935 uh, when Einstein focused attention on this feature of quantum mechanics. Uh, but of course, things have moved uh, tremendously since then. Uh, and today we have a much deeper understanding of uh, quantum entanglement. Uh, and what's clear that it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a bug, but really a key feature of quantum mechanics. And this is one particular experiment that tested uh, this instantaneous uh, uh, effect uh, over large distances, 1.3 kilometers. I think today that distance has been far exceeded uh, including uh, quantum entanglement from the Earth to satellites in space. All right, so let me just describe what it is uh, in the very basic term. Uh, so the basic feature of quantum mechanics uh, is that it's possible to, uh, uh, to superpose distant physical states. So you've probably heard about the double slit experiment where a particle can go both through two slits at the same time or uh, uh, more amusingly, Schrodinger's cat, which can be both alive and dead. Uh, but if you take the same idea of superposition uh, and more seriously apply it to two particles, for example, two electrons in a hydrogen molecule, I'm going to represent the electron by this arrow, which orient tells you whether it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise about some direction. And what's known that in a hydrogen molecule, the two uh, electrons are in this entangled state where if the first electron is spinning clockwise, uh, the other electron is spinning anti-clockwise. So this is one physical state. And a distinct physical state is the opposite uh, spinning of the electrons. And the actual state is the entangled state in which you get a superposition that they really both uh, in both states in some sense at the same time. And it's not determined uh, which state they're in uh, until you actually look at uh, them by an external observation. All right, so, so that may well be the case in the hydrogen uh, molecule as physicists were very early on willing to admit. Uh, but what Einstein pointed out was this thought experiment where you could imagine separating uh, the two electrons without disturbing their spin. Uh, so that one is here and maybe the other is in India. Uh, and then uh, quantum, the rules of quantum mechanics say is that you could still preserve the entanglement. So uh, it's not known whether my electron is up 
uh, or whether your electron is up uh, until one of us looks at it. And if I look at it uh, and I see uh, that it's uh, down, uh, then yours electron is instantaneously determined uh, to be up. So that's uh, the basic definition of quantum entanglement. All right, so that's uh, all I'm going to say to introduce uh, what it is. Uh, so now let's just jump directly ahead uh, to black holes. Uh, so again, black holes were features of uh, Einstein theory of general relativity uh, discovered, I think, already in the 1920s. Uh, but it wasn't until relatively recently that uh, it became clear that black holes are not just figments of somebody's imagination, but actually everywhere uh, in the universe. Uh, I show here oops, uh, a picture uh, from the LOFAR LBS Sky Survey, which actually my wife Usha pointed out to me uh, in a news report just this week. Uh, uh, this is the Sky Survey of about 4% of the northern sky of 52 radio telescopes. Uh, showing 25,000 supermassive black holes. So each little dot here uh, is a supermassive black hole, which has a mass of a million to a billion times the mass of our sun. And each is at the center of its own galaxy. Uh, and there is a similar supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, uh, for which the Nobel Prize observation of which and discovery of which was given uh, just last year. Okay, so what is a black hole? Uh, so it's a solution of Einstein's theory of general relativity in the presence of a mass M. Uh, and if the mass M is sufficiently uh, dense, then the gravitational pull is so strong that even light cannot escape uh, from, uh, from that region. So there's something called the horizon uh, and uh, no light can ever go from inside the horizon according to Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, not just light, or, but any uh, any physical effect uh, can inf inside the horizon can influence what's going out the outside. Uh, and this is the the horizon radius, or the Schwarzschild radius, uh, given a mass m and knowing Newton's constants g and the velocity of light, you can figure out what this radius is. It's amusing to take the Earth's mass and put it in here, and you get a distance of nine millimeters. So you would have to squeeze the earth uh, to a density of, a, you know, to the size of a pea uh, to make it into a black hole. So it's an unimaginably large and high density. But this is actually what happens naturally uh, in astrophysical objects. You get objects of that density. All right, so now uh, let's now introduce quantum entanglement in the context of black holes. So similar to the thought experiment I mentioned earlier, where you separate two electrons from the inside, between the inside and outside, uh, between here and India, let's imagine that our hydrogen molecule splits apart so that one electron falls inside the black hole and the other is outside. So again, quantum mechanics tells us that nothing really, this, this doesn't disturb the entanglement that this electron outside is still entangled uh, with the one inside. So now we have an immediate uh, contradiction with the principle that nothing inside the black hole can influence uh, anything outside the black hole. Uh, at least in principle, uh, measuring uh, this object inside the black hole does influence what's happening outside because it determines and so-called determine the state of this electron that's outside. So, uh, so there is quantum entanglement between the inside and outside of a black hole. Uh, and this feature uh, you know, was uh, highlighted by Bekenstein and then Hawking uh, and it kind of shocked the physics community in, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, where Hawking argued from this feature that in fact, every black hole uh, has a temperature. It's not a featureless black hole. It has a temperature and it's radiating what we call Hawking radiation, and in fact, it's evaporating. And after a very, very long time, much greater than the, uh, the lifetime of the universe, it will just evaporate away. Uh, here, let me just uh, mention just an intuitive feeling of what, what, why there's an entropy and a temperature. Uh, say you have this particular electron in your possession, and you're looking at it. Uh, since you, know, you can never find out 
what's happening inside. I mean, even though what's inside can influence what's outside, you can never find out. There's no information uh, that can go across the horizon, which will tell you the state of that other electron. Uh, so as far as you're concerned, this electron is a random state. Uh, and therefore, to you, this looks like randomness, thermal randomness, uh, and like a temperature. Okay, so, so then to summarize, in quantum black holes, uh, they have both an entropy and a temperature called the Hawking temperature, which I'm going to denote T sub H. Uh, and the entropy is called the Bekenstein Hawking entropy because uh, Bekenstein actually a bit earlier uh, uh, postulated there should be such an ent entropy. Bekenstein also noted uh, through some very different arguments that I haven't presented that the entropy of the black hole should be proportional to its surface area. Uh, and Hawking provided the precise coefficient in front of the surface area uh, and give you a precise number uh, to this Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, and why is it proportional to surface area? This is really the, one of the key uh, things that I want to focus on here. Uh, but it's proportional to surface area because as you can see from this picture, uh, it's entirely due to entanglement across the horizon. So it seems natural that the entropy should be associated with the area of the horizon. Uh, but from a physics point of view, this is uh, extremely confusing and remarkable and really what shocked the physics community because that all many body quantum system, any quantum system that anybody had studied before then, uh, but of course without any quantum gravity because that was you know, not part of the domain of things people were thinking about, uh, every one of them have an entropy which is proportional to their volume. Uh, you know, a cup of water or anything has an entropy proportional to its volume, and that leads to its specific heat that you learn about in high school. Uh, but the black hole seems to be the unique object in the universe whose entropy is proportional to surface area. And understanding this difference is really the key to everything uh, that's followed in the quantum theory of black holes. Uh, so here, uh, sorry, this is a uh, a bit technical, but let me just, it's not really, I'm just uh, writing in symbols, a very simple fact. So, so let's try to understand the Hawking entropy better. And this is what many physicists tried to do soon after the early Hawking papers. So quantum mechanics tells us uh, that when you're computing the quantum mechanics of any system or its thermodynamics, its entropy or anything, what you really need to do uh, is to first take some classical system, for example, for a black hole, you take Einstein gravity, uh, and then sum over with a certain weight, uh, which is determined by the by Planck's constant, all possible configurations. So in the simplest double slit experiment, a particle doing two slits, to understand what happens to the particle, you have to sum over the possibility that it went through the left slit and also went through the right straight slit. So similarly, that same principle applied to gravity would tell us that you have to sum over all possible space times because in, in gravity, space time is our dynamical degree of freedom. And that space time is represented by this metric. So that's, you know, that's the canonical prescription of quantum mechanics. How do you, how do you evaluate this kind of sum over all possible space times, uh, especially near a black hole? Now, this, this expression is easy to write down. Uh, and uh, but it actually in the end means not very much uh, because no one knows how to evaluate this, how to evaluate the sum over all possible space times. And probably it cannot be evaluated because it's full of all kinds of contradictions and infinities that no one knew uh, how to regulate. In fact, trying to evaluate this type of sum is one of the main reasons that string theory was invented by embedding the sum in, in theories in higher dimension. Anyway, despite those difficulties, uh, Gibbons and Hawking said, well, we can make some uh, what are called saddle point arguments, just treat the sum seriously and just evaluate it by looking at the leading behavior uh, where, the, uh, where the, this action uh, has a minimum uh, in appropriate variables. So that surely should be, just be dominated when what's up in the exponential is small. And when they did that, they showed, in fact, you got the leading result, which is what you would expect uh, of exactly the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So, so, so that was ex exciting, uh, but it did tell, really didn't solve the problem. It did, you know, you got the entropy from a kind of a guesswork, but it's not part of a complete quantum theory. We don't know how to compute corrections. We don't know how to 
answer various questions of what would happen later in time, what would happen when two black holes collide, and many other physical questions you can ask uh, are really left open uh, by this uh, paper of Gibbons and Hawking. All right, so, so that's where the situation stood in 77, and many physicists worked on it. Uh, and I would say that some real progress, I mean, some amazing progress was made by a string theory where they introduced the idea of holography and duality. Uh, so the basic idea here is that if you want to complete this quantum gravity path integral, uh, we should think of the quant this quantum gravity in a different set of variables. So this is what we call a duality. We're going to go from one set of variables, which is the values of gravity, uh, to another set of variables. And, and those variables will be in actually a more familiar system. That would be just a quantum theory without gravity. And then finally, just to solve this entropy problem, because we know that any reasonable quantum system without gravity has an entropy proportion to the volume. So for, so this to match up between the left and the right hand side, uh, this quantum system must be in one lower dimension. So it's rough, roughly it should be sitting on the surface of the black hole. So if the black hole is in D spatial dimensions, uh, then this quantum system should be in D minus one space dimensions. Uh, another way to say it, uh, that's where the word holography comes in. Uh, this quantum system of, uh, that's representing the dynamics in a new set of variables uh, is, is a hologram. You know, the, you know, hologram is when you take a three dimensional image and represent it by a two dimensional hologram. So our, our quantum system has the same information, the same uh, dynamics, the same equations of motion, uh, which is, and the quantum system is in two spatial dimensions uh, as a black hole, which is in three uh, spatial dimensions. Of course, it's uh, very complicated, and in, in many, most cases, we don't know how to do the change of variables to go from the you know, variables natural to describe the quantum system to describe uh, the uh, uh, the gravitational system in one higher dimensions. Uh, um, even in string theory, this is can't be done explicitly, uh, but it gave very convincing evidence that there indeed is such a correspondence. Okay. Uh, so now I want to mention one other feature of black holes in addition to these two of quantum black holes, uh, and that has to do with their dynamics when they evolve in time. You know, a black hole on its own, of course, is sitting there forever, uh, like a, not forever, excuse me, because it's evaporating, but that's extremely slow. Uh, so it's like a thermodynamic system, like a black body, which is in equilibrium almost. Uh, however, let's consider a more dynamic situation uh, where, for example, two black holes merge into each other. Uh, and this was exactly this merger that uh, and, the, and the gravitational waves emitted from this merger that were observed by LIGO in 2015, uh, and many, many more have since been uh, merged. And uh, I guess uh, I'm sure you all know that our LIGO observatory is being, uh, a gravitational wave observatory is being built in India also. So here's the original data showing uh, the gravitational waves coming in from the black hole and the, and the merger. So at the very end of the merger, you just get a bigger black hole uh, with a slightly bigger, with a bigger radius and the mass roughly the sum of the original masses. Some of the mass is radiated into the gravitational waves. Okay, so now you, uh, what I want to focus on here is the ring downtime when the black holes, when you go from almost merge to a quiescent, uh, uh, a completely stationary black hole. So this ring down is dominated by uh, uh, by black hole quasi-normal modes, as they're called, which were discovered by Professor Vishveshwara in India. Uh, so these quasi-normal modes have a typical damping frequency, if you wish, that's like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and so you can try to work out in Einstein's equation what that damping time is. And it turns out to be this number here for this particular black hole that's about eight milliseconds. Uh, However, the curious thing is that if you express, and an important thing from the rest of my talk, is that if you express this ring down time uh, using uh, the Hawking temperature, it's this very simple expression. It's Planck's constant, 
uh, divided by Hawking temperature. Uh, ignore the KB, uh, that's boson constant. We only need it because we measure uh, temperature in strained units like degrees Kelvin or degrees centigrade. Uh, okay, so Planck constant divided by Hawking temperature is the ring down time generically of essentially all black holes. So let me uh, put that here as the third important feature of a black hole that I will need for the rest of my discussion. Okay, so, uh, and these three features now tell us something. So from the benefit of all the advances in string theory, uh, these three features, as I said earlier, imply uh, that black holes can be represented a hologram by a quantum many body system in one lower dimension. Uh, but to that, I want to add one more constraint. It's not just any many body system, since that many body system, when it thermally equilibrates, uh, will also imply that the black hole has thermally equilibrated. Uh, so it must be uh, the following that the hologram of a black hole in D dimension is a quantum many body particle system in D minus one dimensions, which will access to thermal equilibrium in this time, which I now call the Planckian time, Planck's constant divided by temperature. So we have to find at the very least, this is a minimal requirement for our many body system uh, that it relax uh, in this time. And this actually uh, turned out to be you know, the key as far as my own work is concerned. In fact, I was thinking about exactly this issue even though I wasn't thinking about black holes, but I was thinking about the issue of how to find many body system that can reflect, reflect to equilibrium in H power over KT. Uh, and uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but I think I, this may be a good point to pause if there are questions. So this, so now that I've you know, at least covered the basics of quantum black holes and uh, uh, and holography. So wonder if there's any pressing question, I can take it now. Yeah, maybe if somebody has a question, they can raise the hand or type in the chat box. Okay, then I'll proceed. So I told you about quantum black holes. And so let's now talk about, uh, of course, my favorite model uh, that Spenta mentioned of quantum entanglement. Uh, so, but, okay, but let me just actually talk more generally before I tell you what, you know, excited me about this model way back in 1992, 93. Uh, let's talk about other many body systems. So one, you know, this isn't really now coming close to uh, the domain of condensed matter physics. Uh, so we experience quantum many body system in everyday, li everyday lives, especially in metals. So to understand why metals are such good conductors uh, and why they're so reflective is very much understood through a quantum many body problem. Uh, metals consist of electrons that are moving through uh, through the entire crystal, quantum mechanically uh, as waves. Uh, and that motion, the fact that they move so freely very much requires an understanding of quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, so, and they of course feel each other because they're interacting. So perhaps they're entangled and, uh, and a metal could serve as a toy model uh, for a black hole in the sense of holography. Uh, the answer for that turns out to be no. Uh, because in some sense, metals are not entangled enough. So what happens in a metal that we understand extremely well today and certainly was understood at the time I was learning all this in, uh, in, uh, in my physics classes. Uh, so if you think of a metal as made up of many electrons moving around uh, and carrying current, uh, those, those electrons do feel each other and entangle with each other a little bit, but the entanglement uh, is rather limited. Because what happens in the end uh, is that if you just stop worrying about the actual bare electron, but worry about a quasi-electron or a quasi-particle, which is an electron with a cloud of a few other electrons around it, uh, shaking a bit, uh, then this quasi-particle behaves as if it's essentially an independent electron. So the entanglement kind of stops and you just have the quasi-particle moving on its own. So that's really... In fact, the assumption in the vast majority of, uh, uh, of materials, and in fact, the assumption often unstated in the, the by far the vast majority of papers in physical review B, that 
you just deal with these quasi particle and then you're done with any for many particle quantum entanglement. I should say that situation is changing, of course, today, but certainly when I was in graduate school, uh, this was assumed without even uh, state, stating it. Uh, so one way you can quantify this uh, is by asking how long does it take for the uh, for electrons in a metal to thermal equilibrium to just scatter off each other and feel each other presence and become a like a black body. Well, that gives you some time, a scattering time tau. Uh, and so you can compute this time as you learn in uh, various courses. Uh, and you find that time is much, much longer, parametrically longer than this Planckian time, uh, uh, H Planck's constant divided by temperature. So, so that pretty much rules out a metal, and that's no surprise, as serving as a model for a, uh, for a black hole. Um, so the, yeah, so, and it's intimately related to, as I've been discussing, uh, the fact that the quasi-particle concept uh, makes sense. So there is some entanglement, but the end particles actually behave that they're largely independent of each other. Okay, so metals don't do it. Uh, so what does do it? So now is, I can introduce my favorite model. Uh, so let me just, uh, so this was a model that, uh, uh, proposed in 1993, along with my uh, first graduate student, uh, Jin Uye. Uh, the version I'm presenting is actually Kitab's version in 2015. It has the same properties uh, and it simplifies some of its uh, properties uh, a lot, uh, but it's basically the same. Uh, so here's, uh, uh, um, so here's how I define it. So you pick a random set of positions. Uh, it doesn't really matter how you distribute them. Uh, and then uh, occupy a fraction of them, these purple uh, purple regions. So here I'm actually ignoring the spin. These are electrons, but I'm just not drawing their spin. Uh, and now quantum mechanically, uh, these electrons are going to move around. And in fact, quantum mechanics says, you know, take all possible configurations and sum them over uh, and all possible motions. And each motion is uh, characterized by, by what you call a transition amplitude. Uh, whose square is the probability that that motion happens. So the key feature of this model uh, is that motion uh, always ha happens uh, in pairs. So for example, uh, so this is just a postulate. You know, we were just looking for a model uh, that would do the trick in terms of having a Planckian time behavior. And so this is, and there were other physical reasons for this where this was a very natural thing to do, which I haven't, which I will discuss to the end of my talk. Uh, so imagine you have these two electrons and quantum mechanically, they're going to tunnel, as we say, from these two sides to these two sides. Of course, these are, these are identical electrons, so we can't tell whether this electron is going here uh, or is it going there. So those are both really equivalent. Uh, and really, so this process happens uh, with, some, with some amplitude, okay. And then you can imagine many other processes like this. You pick uh, those two and then they can move here and happen with some amplitude and so on. So any given physical system would have some set of numbers associated with every one of these uh, processes for which you really need to understand the details of exactly where these electrons were, the environment to figure out what these numbers were. Uh, and what we did was, well, that seems like too difficult a problem. Uh, we knew there was some sort of randomness in the materials we were interested in. So we said, okay, let's to, to make progress, let's just assume anything that can happen will happen uh, in terms of these two particle motions, uh, but assign each of these a fixed random number. So every process is associated with it, uh, a random amplitude, whoops. And, and that's pretty much the whole story. That is the full model. Uh, to particle hopping with random amplitudes uh, between any pair of sites. Uh, and these have to be fermions uh, for this to work. Okay, so that turns out to be a model uh, that, you know, uh, is, in some sense is, is exactly in the right place because it's complicated enough to have the physics of complex many particle entanglement, but also simple enough that we can actually work many, many things out exactly. So, so it's that ideal place, which, uh, you know, 
which we were, uh, you know, which we always want to be a physicist, and uh, we were lucky enough uh, to have found one such place. Uh, all right, so you can solve it, and I won't go into the details of how it's done. Uh, but what you find, in fact, that it does indeed have complex many particle entanglement, and that you can show that it has no quasi particles. So it's one of those rare physical system which does not have quasi particle excitations. Uh, more precisely, this means that you can't think of uh, higher energy states of the system as being built up of composing multiple quasi particle excitations. In some sense, every excitation. It's different. It's, it has a very different entanglement than any one that came before it. In an ordinary metal, you know, you could have one electron moving here, another one moving here, and you can say, well, here's an excitation where they're both moving. And the wave function of them both moving is basically uh, just composes of two pieces of the two individual electrons moving. This you cannot do uh, in the SYK model. Uh, and also you can compute, and this was done a bit later by uh, Antoine George and Olivier Parcolet in, uh, in Paris. Uh, you can show that common equilibration time of such a system uh, is exactly uh, the Planckian time. Okay, so we found a system that at least has a Planckian uh, time relaxation. So is it a hologram of some black hole? or all black holes? And the answer, of course, that is no. Uh, but it turns out it is approximately an hologram of a certain class of black holes. And that's something uh, we know today. So let me try to describe that. Uh, and the class of black holes we need to consider uh, are black holes uh, called Reisner and Nordstrom black holes in which they have a net charge. So because they have charge, there's also electric fields. And so it's not sufficient to just work with Einstein's theory of general relativity. We also have to include Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and look at these Reisner Nordstrom solutions of black holes with net charge. Now, all the black holes I showed you uh, really have negligible charge in the universe. I mean, the supermassive black holes I mentioned earlier, most likely there's no charge. So this doesn't apply, I think, almost certainly to any realistic black hole. Uh, but there are also black holes that rotate quite at a very high angular momentum. Uh, and although I'm not going to discuss it, some of these considerations also apply to uh, rotating black holes, as was pointed out in this paper by uh, Moitra Sake, Trivedi, and Vishal. Uh, Trivedi, of course, is our friend Sandeep Trivedi, the former director of uh, TIFR. So what's special about uh, this charged black hole? Well, it has a feature, and this is already evident at the classical Einstein level, and then as you zoom in to the vicinity of the horizon of the black hole, uh, it undergoes a dimensional transmutation. That is, when you're far away, you're in ordinary three-dimensional space. Uh, and space time looks three-dimensional to you if you were falling in. Uh, but as you near the horizon, uh, space time will start to look one-dimensional to you. You will just be, you'll only see this direction zeta. So you're in one space dimension and you're, completely oblivious to what's happening uh, at different points on the sphere. So you can, uh, as a physicist, then, if you want to write down equations to the disaster that's happening to you, uh, you can just work in one space dimension, which is a good thing because that's a lot easier. Uh, but you don't have to worry about any of the angular uh, degrees of freedom. So this is just a feature of a charged black hole. Ordinary Schwarzschild black holes don't have that feature. Uh, which is what makes them harder to study. So here's another picture of the same uh, the same drawing. Uh, I've just kind of, so this angular coordinate X uh, is this coordinate here. Uh, this is the coordinate zeta. Uh, and this, you see space spatial direction shrinking to represent this curvature of space time. And then there's some horizon over here. And so this horizon, if you did a theory of gravity, uh, Hawking would tell you that uh, there's some entropy associated with this, which is the area of that horizon. But what we want to do to go beyond Hawking via holography is to go compute corrections and show that it's really part of a complete quantum theory. Okay, and, and the reason you can do that here 
uh, is because of this dimensional transmutation. So, in fact, you could think of space time as made up of two different dimensions. So, when you're in the near the horizon, uh, space time appears to have two space time dimensions, well, one space and one time, the radial direction and time. Uh, and it has a curvature, a negative curvature, which is characterized by what's called anti de Sitter space. Uh, and this has some nice symmetry properties that I won't go into here. Uh, so that's our two dimensional space time. And then far away, it's the usual three plus one dimensional space time that we are familiar with. So it turns out in thinking about the corrections to the Hawking uh, entropy formula, we have to do the quantum mechanics for something uh, of something fluctuating and some over all its configurations. Uh, and what is that something? Well, it turns out that that's uh, we, just the boundary between these regions. So there is some actual physical quantum fluctuation which contribute to the entropy at low temperatures uh, and our corrections to the Hawking theory. And that's this boundary graviton. All right, so, so if you focus on this boundary region, then in fact, this horrible path integral that I mentioned earlier of all possible space-time configurations much become much more manageable because you only have to integrate over space-time configurations in one plus one dimensional space-time rather than three plus one, which is a much, much harder problem. Okay, um, so, so here's the logic then uh, and the main result. Uh, so you start with the Einstein-Maxwell theory in three space and one time dimension. You go to the near horizon region or what's called the low temperature limit for the temperature, the Hawking temperature. And you end up with some theory uh, of gravity in this two dimensional space time and, and its boundary. And so you can approximate it by this. And finally, you have an integral uh, that can be evaluated. Now, I should say that this step, this dimensional reduction, uh, you know, could have been done, uh, I don't know, 50, 30, 40 years ago. There's nothing new. Uh, this is completely canonical Einstein gravity uh, calculation to do this dimensional reduction. But it wasn't done because people never really thought this would be any use because this particular theory also, I, I'm just guessing, uh, could be that interesting. Well, uh, amazingly it is. And, and in fact, the history goes, the reason people eventually started thinking about this uh, is because of precisely the uh, connection to the SYK model. So, uh, so you, one can show, and this is a very precise mathematical statement that these two, the quantum mechanics of these two systems are uh, completely equivalent. Uh, one is gravity in two dimensions. And the other is the simple model of entangled qubits that I've showed you. Uh, and because of that, the thermodynamics and many other properties uh, of the two are essentially identical. So the hologram of the one plus one dimensional gravity uh, should be something in zero plus one dimensions. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure that thought had occurred to people in string theory, but no one could really come up with uh, a reasonable model in zero plus one dimension that looked anything like a black hole. Uh, well, the SYK model does the trick uh, and it's in zero dimension because there was no sense of space. Everything could move anywhere. So it's really like just a little quantum dot. Uh, okay, um, so just to mention a few names here. So of course, I should say, the idea that there was a connection uh, uh, between these two sides of the equations uh, occurred to me about 2010 uh, where I noticed a lot of common features on the both sides and said, really, there should be a connection. Uh, but to my disappointment, no one paid the slightest attention to this paper. Uh, luckily, I published it. Uh, so a lesson to the young students, if you have a crazy idea, but you think it's right, at the very least, publish it. Uh, anyway, so that was published. And, and then uh, I was amazed to hear about the work of Kichai in 2015, uh, where he not only essentially uh, you know, gave, gave much more meat to this idea and proved not only the, idea, the main idea, but also its extensions uh, through a very clever set of arguments. Um, I should also mention that there's been work at TIFR uh, in firming up these connections in various directions by the group of uh, Sandeep Trivedi already mentioned, and also by our uh, host, uh, Spenta Vardia, 
and uh, and Gautam Mandal. Okay, so to conclude then, uh, there's a very simple and precise mathematical result, uh, which is quite remarkable uh, and something that can be you know, taught to an advanced undergraduate or beginning graduate student in physics uh, without spending several years learning string theory, excuse me, uh, <laughs> that you could start with Einstein uh, gravity and look at its low energy limit and quantize it uh, and show explicitly uh, with, with the explicit change of variables now very well understood it is the same theory as the low temperature limit uh, of the SYK model. Okay. All right, so let me just then summarize then what I've talked about so far. Uh, I've talked about two very different physical systems, charged black holes and this SYK model. Uh, and at very low temperatures, they both are equivalent to essentially the same quantum theory of quantum gravity uh, in one plus one space-time dimensions. Uh, and you know why this remarkable connection exists is ultimately related to quantum entanglement. These are both systems with complex entanglement without quasi-particles, and they also share this Planckian time uh, uh, behavior, which they very very rapidly thermal equilibrate. Uh, of course, this is not a sufficient condition. There are now we know many, several other condensed matter systems that uh, have this behavior. And I'm going to mention one in the very next uh, slide, uh, but uh, not all of them are due to some simple black hole anyway. They're probably due to some rather complicated black hole in a way that's not very useful. Uh, this particular connection has turned out to be quite useful uh, in understanding more deeply uh, the properties of the SYK model itself. Uh, something I certainly would not have dreamt of in 1993 when I was playing with this model. But that was 1993 was also well built before the idea of holography came about in string theory. All right, so in the last part of my talk, finally, let me mention the last word uh, in my title. I think I'm doing pretty, uh, one that I have about 10 minutes. Okay, well, I'm going to assume I do. Yeah. So let me now talk about superconductors uh, and their connection to the SYK model. I should say at the outside, this connection, even though it was the original motivation of coming up this model, uh, is really at the level of giving us some general physical insight. Uh, I, I'm not claiming that I'm going to, I can take a cup, uh, an actual material superconductor and relate it to uh, you know, exactly the SYK model in some laboratory. Uh, that's not true, but it's, it's giving us a lot of insight, as I hope to mention in the next few minutes, and understanding the property of these materials. On the other hand, there is, you know, an exact equivalence in a sense that I've outlined between these two these two objects here, with the charred black hole and the SYK model. So that connection is actually stronger. Uh, so here's a picture of a high temperature superconductor. Here's a complicated uh, just, uh, structure. And uh, here's a little piece of it. Uh, it's a ceramic material. Uh, so uh, they're not terribly good conductors at room temperature. So we, uh, what the remarkable thing is if you take the ceramic, which is not even a metal uh, or a good metal uh, and lower it to liquid nitrogen temperatures, uh, it conducts electricity better than any metal with essentially zero resistance. Uh, so here's a, a lecture demonstration of a little cake of yttrium barium copper oxide, uh, which has been dipped in this uh, liquid nitrogen here, which can, uh, yeah, hopefully that works, float over uh, a bunch of ordinary bar magnets because it uh, expels the magnetic field. Uh, I should say this has been video prepared by Professor Nandini Trivedi at Ohio State, uh, and she's the sister of our former director, uh, Sandeep Trivedi. Okay, so the material is of course uh, extremely complicated, uh, but fortunately it turns out that you can just focus on a given la a single layer uh, of copper atoms and even ignore the oxygen. So you have these copper atoms which just sit perfectly on the vertices uh, of a square lattice. And then uh, if you take the insulating parent before uh, this becomes superconducting, 
and look at what the electrons are doing, you find there's one active electron on every copper atom. And the spins of those electrons are not entangled. They're actually in this rigid configuration, uh, which is similar to a chessboard, where half the electrons are pointing down and the other half are pointing up, uh, with every neighbor of a down electron being an up electron. OK, so this is what we call an antiferromagnet. And it's an insulator because uh, if you try to move any electron, you've got to occupy two electrons on the same site for this to move. I know that's allowed, but it costs a lot of energy. And so the electrons just stay apart from each other because of their Coulomb repulsion uh, and form an insulator. So to get this thing to move, get the electrons to move, you have to you have to create a space. So there's a total traffic jam right now. But if you create a few empty spaces, uh, then the electrons can move. And in fact, at low temperatures, they move so well that there's essentially zero resistance. So they go from a state of infinite resistance to zero resistance at, as temperature goes to zero. Uh, and so the electrons can now move without bumping into each other. Uh, for example, uh, so you have density P of holes in a background of, flux, of spins. Uh, so then when they move, now this process has some amplitude T, uh, and that's allowed. And also they can uh, flip the disturb their spins, and this, uh, which is amplitude J. So this is what's called the TJ model of electrons moving on a square lattice and perturbing their, each of their spins. So the TJ model uh, was understood already at the very beginning uh, by work by uh, uh, Phil Anderson and also Bhaskaran in India uh, as the basic ingredient of superconductivity. Uh, and we're still trying to solve it and understand its properties. So it has motion of electrons. It has entanglement in some very interesting way. And we don't really have a complete solution, but there's been you know, a lot of progress. In particular, there's very little doubt that this very simple TJ model is uh, the basic physics of high temperature superconductivity. Um, so here's a phase diagram, as we call it, uh, with temperature on the vertical axis and doping on the horizontal axis. P. Uh, this was the antiferromagnetic insulator. But as you dope it, you get a superconductor, temperatures as high as 100 Kelvin, which is above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. But you also get some metallic states. And this, these are the states that a lot of us have been studying, trying to understand their properties, because it's in these states that the entanglement uh, has its strongest effect. Uh, and I think most people believe that once we understand these states, then the why, you know, the why the critical temperature is so high will follow quite naturally, um, because uh, this is the parent from which the superconducting child appears at lower temperature. Uh, and in particular, I want to just focus on this one experiment among the many thousands of experiments that have been done over the, over the past decades uh, in this region called the strange metal, because it turns out this strange metal is in fact according to uh, near this critical doping PC, where the uh, which is the key thing we need to understand, uh, where the connection to black holes is in fact uh, the closest. So we go to PC, uh, and in, so here's one particular experiment that I mentioned, and the, what they measure by some very clever uh, techniques of following the magnet, uh, resistance in a magnetic field at different angles of the field. Uh, very recent work, uh, just from last uh, November of last year. Um, and what they measure is the sc scattering time that I mentioned uh, when I was talking about metals. And what they find, up with some corrections having to do with the crystal structure that I won't mention, uh, that the scattering time, in fact, is the Planckian time. Uh, so this is quite remarkable. Uh, you now have a very clean evidence that near this critical doping, uh, these electrons, for not very well understood reasons, are behaving, satisfy one of the key requirements for some connection to the complex entanglement found near a black hole. Uh, so I'll just conclude by mentioning that. So we've been trying, you know, we, we are trying, we trying to understand this puzzle. There have been many other indications earlier of this Planck in time. Uh, this is probably the cleanest so far. Uh, so I'll just tell you about very recent work 
uh, with collaboration with a uh, few of my colleagues. Uh, this is Antoine George, uh, whose name I mentioned earlier, who's now in New York at the Flatiron Institute, and uh, Alexander Vitek is a postdoc there. Henry is one of my students at Harvard, and also some work with the student Maria Tikhonovskaya at Harvard, how you go, uh, and Grisha Tarnapolsky, who's a postdoc at Harvard. So, so we, so I just show some pictures and conclude my talk. So we're trying to understand, you know, what kind of model, uh, how this Planckian behavior in the high temperature superconductors. So of course, what we need to do is solve the TJ model that I mentioned in the square lattice, uh, but that's too hard. So we're trying to, we try to make some simplification. Uh, and the simplification we've been focusing on, uh, you wouldn't be surprised to hear, is to just take the TJ model and make everything random. So really very much in the spirit of the SYK model. Uh, and the hope is that this looking at this random model won't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You would still get most of the physics. And I don't have time, but I can go into great detail in a more technical talk and why we believe that's the case. Uh, so we take a model of a bunch of sites and now we put electrons on, on, on the sites, but we also keep track of their spins. And rather than allowing electrons to only move in pairs, which is highly unphysical, we do exactly what happens in nature, uh, which is you allow the electrons to move on their own with the amplitude T. So, uh, and the main difference from the actual physical model in, in neutrino barium copper oxide is that we take T to be a random number. Okay, so they can move from here to there or here to there with an amplitude T while preserving their spin. So if you look at uh, the pictures, this is pointing here as it moves. Oops, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me go back. Yeah, this is pointing here uh, and it's pointing in the same direction. So that's a one particle motion, which is absent in the SYK model. And then we also allow for the spins to exchange. So uh, let's see where this happens. Yeah, so if I go back, so these two the spins are pointing this way. So there's some amplitude for this spin here to point in that direction. So they exchange each other. And there's an amplitude, which is J. Okay. So that's the model, period, uh, with random exchange and random hopping. Uh, very physical, other than the random part. Uh, okay. So this model is still way too hard to solve exactly. But we made a lot of progress by a variety of methods. And we think we are starting to understand its properties. Uh, and I'll just uh, show you now one somewhat technical picture uh, of some results from just doing this on a computer, putting that problem on a computer and solving it uh, through some, you know, maybe uh, very complicated numerical work requiring the computational effort that was done at the Flatiron Institute. So what result of these calculations, uh, which is prob we plot here the probability to flip, flip an electron spin while absorbing energy h bar omega. So this is the probability, uh, and this is the frequency omega. Uh, and it's done for various hole densities. So at the very lowest hole densities, where in the physical system, you had an antiferromagnet with this chessboard of arrangement of spins. Uh, now you get what's called a spin glass, where the spins are frozen, but in random orientations. Okay, so, but this is only present for lower doping. If you go to very high doping, uh, you get, again, I'm not showing all the data here, quite good evidence of just ordinary metallic behavior. So at high doping, it looks like copper or gold or aluminum, at least as far as the electron motion is considered on this random cluster. Uh, but I want to focus on attention on what happens in between. So there turns out to be a special critical region near the strange metal behavior that I showed you in the experiments, where in fact, if you compute it's this particular quantity or, and several other quantities, uh, it fully matches this, the behavior you get from the SYK model. In particular, you get this uh, susceptibility, which has this jump at zero frequency and then a linear decay uh, in this form. Uh, and in fact, if you now take the SYK model and compute uh, this, uh, this exactly this quantity, you find that this linear decay is precisely the correction uh, from the boundary graviton. So the boundary graviton shows up in the spectrum, if you wish, of this 
you know, quite physical model. So, so that's the result of this work. Uh, and, it, you know, uh, coming out the evidence from this numerical study of this model. Um, and hope we don't fully understand why this is happening, but uh, I believe the key ingredient is the following. There's one more concept that needs to be introduced here that I haven't talked about, uh, and that's the idea of fractionalization. So we notice this model has electrons moving on its own, which is not something that's part of uh, the SYK model. But what if an electron fractionalizes, split apart into pieces which carry its spin and charge separately? Uh, then, in fact, an electron moving on its own is two partons, as we call them, moving in together. So, so if you take a theory of partons of an electron, then you will get very much the physics of the SYK model. Uh, and uh, so we have several papers on this in the past year explaining this behavior, the TJ model, how it's really looking like an SYK model of partons. All right, so that's really work in progress, but just to give you a flavor. So I, I conclude then. Um, so these are the various topics I've talked about. Uh, charged black holes and SYK models are, you know, quite rigorously connected now okay. through this low energy limit in quantum, uh, in two-dimensional quantum gravity. Uh, and I've told you about uh, explorations on how there's a connection uh, near this critical doping in physical high temperature superconductors uh, of this Planckian physics of the SYK model. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Subir, for a very, very interesting talk covering really uh, connecting very widely different uh, fields. We have a few questions in the chat box, so I will read them out and then we can, uh, of course, take questions from the audience. So the question from uh, Unikrishnan is, uh, why is there such a drastic difference in the dimensional behavior, 3 to 1, between a Schwarzschild black hole and a black hole with a few charges? Do you need an externally charged black hole for this? Uh, the answer is yes. So uh, I'm not sure I can give an intuitive explanation for this. Uh, if you just solve Einstein's equation, the presence of uh, net charge, then near the horizon, uh, you do find that uh, that space time looks two dimensional. Uh, I don't know, maybe Sandeep Trivedi, who is in the audience, can give a better answer. Uh, I mean, roughly speaking, what happens in a charged black hole um, is that uh, the electric charges want the black hole to explode uh, because, well, charges repel each other, whereas the uh, gravitational attraction wants the black particles to collapse. So there's a balance between repulsive and, uh, and attractive forces. And so in a charged black hole near the horizon at low temperatures, as we say, uh, this, this, there's a very delicate balance between the repulsive and, and attractive forces. And, and that's roughly what leads to this dimensional reductions. So it doesn't require quantum mechanics to understand that. That is a property of Einstein's equations, uh, I guess, for, uh, by the reisner nordstrom solution. I'm not sure when that was done. Uh, it's also present, as I mentioned very briefly, in ro black holes that are rotating uh, very rapidly. Uh, and that uh, was this dimensional reduction, and that's something that I also mentioned in the work of Srivedi at all, looking at that effect. Uh, Subir, can I um, make a little Yes, please, Gautam. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so just to, uh, <clears throat> to say some uh, comment in addition to what you said, is that uh, it is not, uh, you know, any charged uh, black hole that would uh, reduce uh, dimensionally to ADS2 but ex only extremal charged black holes would reduce radius too, and um, near extremal black holes would uh, reduce to near. Okay. Uh, so I, I think I, I implied that low temperature, as long as the temperature is smaller than the inverse horizon radius, you're automatically extremal. So I, okay, in less technical terms, I believe I said the same thing, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we move on to the next question. Question from Vipul Rai. Does the entanglement system violate the special relativity? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so roughly speaking, you know, you might, and, but you know, that's not obvious. I mean, that's roughly why Einstein didn't like it. 
because mm-hmm. it seemed to ha- have something traveling faster than the velocity of light. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, you know, there's no actual physical effect that's traveling faster than the velocity of light. Uh, what you have to accept is that the notion of a quantum state is not local. So if you have two electrons, uh, which are very far away, uh, they are part of the same quantum state. They interacted in the past. Uh, and really what's bizarre about entanglement is that the state is not is a is a superposition that the state of one electron is not determined and independent of the other but the state is an entangled state and it's neither here nor there it's really in both places so nothing is going from here to there uh, the only way you can know that your two uh, electrons were entangled uh, if you had you know if alice and bob as we say had two and entangled electrons the only way they can know that's the case uh, is both of them doing measurements on a, on many samples, and then communicating via regular phone call after the measurements and checking that they always saw opposite. Uh, and that second phone call is essentially needed, and that has to occur at the speed that's slower than the velocity of light. So that's why there's no there's no contradiction with that nothing can travel faster than the velocity of light. Okay, there's a question from Sahil Kumar Singh. In the random TJ model, only nearest neighbor hopping is allowed. Is that right? Uh, no, no. The random TJ model that we considered uh, has hopping between any, there is no sense of space again. Uh, so it is, you know, a drastic approximation, uh, but we believe that it's, it helps understand many physical points. Uh, you can hop between any pair of sites, okay. as you can see in this picture. Okay, there are many questions also on YouTube. So I will take two YouTube questions and come back to Zoom again. So one of the questions from Quasar Supernova in YouTube is what is the origin of randomness in the hopping amplitudes? Uh, So I presume the question is about the actual uh, material. So the materials, in fact, and I didn't show the data, also have spin glass phases, which is, uh, so if you take, if you look very carefully down here at low doping, uh, you will have a spin glass order, very much like the random model. Uh, and we know from the work study on spin glasses, there's the famous Parisi solution uh, of classical spin glasses, which is also done in a very similar all-to-all random model uh, and get a great deal of insight. Uh, so what is the origin of randomness? Uh, well, in the physical system, uh, it's really you need some randomness to introduce these holes. So if I take a perfect crystal, in fact, without the plus X, uh, then you will end up getting uh, just this configuration of spins, which is an insulator. So how do we remove some of the electrons? The way you remove the electrons uh, is add extra oxygen. And the oxygen being electronegative will absorb the electrons and they'll move away from the copper planes and then come into the oxygen, which are sitting. In fact, uh, where are the oxygen? Yeah, so this there's an extra line of oxygens here called the, the chains. Uh, if I've got it right, yeah, I think the red squares are oxygen. Uh, and those, so so basically when you when you make this crystal, you very carefully control the oxygen environment and there are randomly vacancies here. So there is randomness. And in some sense, uh, unfortunately in these materials anyway, you can't remove it. So you have to, there has to be randomness to remove the electrons. So, so the fact that there are these empty sites, some of the red sites are missing, uh, is very intrinsic to these materials and needed to dope it. And so there is always some randomness. So, you know, the perfect TJ model that I'm showing you here with the same T and the same J everywhere is is also a fiction, uh, but it's less of a fiction but, than my fully random model. There's a question from Amit Devkar. In BCS theory, a Cooper pair tends to follow Bose-Einstein statistics, even though electron is fermion. So when we consider a quasi-particle, does its spin differ from the spin of an electron? Okay, great question. So if quasi-particles can uh, also have different flavors. So if I take a quasi-particle, which is electron-like, a single electron with uh, electron hole pairs around it, uh, then yes, it has the same spin and charge as an electron. It has spin I half and charge E, uh, and it's a fermion. But there are other quasi-particles like Cooper pairs, uh, which I didn't discuss, which you mentioned, where electrons pair, uh, and, and that 
Cooper pair is another type of quasi particle, which is a boson and it spins zero and charge two E. Uh, and it's that boson, uh, when it condenses, undergoes Bose Einstein condensation that you get superconductivity. Uh, I just didn't discuss that, of course, I'd, <laughs> given the length of time and the many topics I talked about. All right, so we come back to Zoom now and take a couple of questions from here. So first, uh, Udita Shukla and then Prasad Jaisud. Thank you, Dr. Sachdev, for the talk. It's my very first introduction to the SYK model. So my question is that when you were introducing the, uh, the SYK model in the beginning, the first criteria that you mentioned is that uh, they need to be fermions. Uh, that is, quantum indistinguishability is an integral part. Uh, so, if uh, is there also a criteria, or is will the SYK model show different dynamics if we add, if we account for quantum numbers? For example, if we take quarks, they have many other quantum numbers like spin and color charge and flavor charge, although they are present at different energy scales. Unlike of a black hole, or unlike in a copper superconductor that you discussed, they are present in neutron stars at super nuclear saturation densities. So, do you think SYK model could have a connection there as well? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, and the short answer is yes, to the same extent it has a connection to superconductivity. Yeah, so the important part is uh, that they have uh, they're fermionic. Uh, all the other quantum numbers you can add as additional bells and whistles to the uh, flavor and uh, color and so on uh, to the to the SYK type model. Uh, and uh, there have been many studies of such things. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some sense, yeah, there is a, you know, quark clone plasma is another example of a system uh, which, uh, which is Planckian like. Uh, and that was pointed out by uh, Cofton Stone and Stavanov in a very important paper. Uh, and so that also has the relaxation time h bar over kt. Uh, and to understand it, you have to solve, you know, QCD in a high density regime. Uh, and uh, so that you could think of SYK as some kind of toy model of a quark blown plasma. I mean, again, it's not literally describing quark blown plasma, but it has many similar characteristics that are very helpful in understanding uh, the more realistic quark blown plasma. And uh, just a second question. Uh, so uh, I understand there would be some merit in trying to figure out the scattering time in case a Cooper pair is formed between a quark and a quark or an antiquark and an antiquark in neutron star densities. Um, yes, I mean, uh, so the idea is that when you're in the quark clone plasma or the SYK phase, the concept of a Cooper pair, the concept of a particle itself doesn't make any sense. Everything is so strongly entangled that you just have the soup of quantum matter that's moving around. And if you insist on writing down some equations for its motion, uh, the simplest equation you can write down are the same equations that control the motion of the horizon of a black hole. So that's quasi-classical description, if you wish, of this quark clone plasma. Now, as you lower the temperature and you form a superconductor, then I, again, the concept of, you know, Cooper pairs and quarks, uh, not, yeah, re-emerges, uh, but it emerges out of that soup. So then you're no longer in some sense in the SYK phase, you're really in the new phase, which is the superconductor, uh, where the identity of the particle, that this is a boson, this is a Cooper pair, and this is a quark, uh, becomes more clearer. Thank you. Okay, very good question. Thank you. Prasad Jaisud. Yeah, hi, Subir. Uh, great talk. Uh, just two simple uh, queries. Number one is that the last part, when you talked about this random TJ, you think it can also apply to quantum spin liquid phase where you can uh, look at these effects? Where um, people well, talk of neuron of fermions and so on. So do you suspect what would be the same physics? Uh, well, I mean, we so quantum spin liquids or insulating quantum spin liquids, uh, we do, uh, you know, in some cases understand much better. We don't need to make the drastic approximation of taking fully random interactions because they're uh, well understood. But if you take a quantum spin liquid in a, in a realistic sample with randomness, uh, which also has uh, lots of gapless excitations, essentially zero energy excitations. Uh, 
So, you know, maybe a superconductor with many Majorana bound states and uh, sort of random couplings between them. Uh, then, yes, I mean, in principle, you could be in some SYK like regime. So I think, I yeah, many people are trying now. You know, so the one question here really is how big is this SYK domain? You know, there's no question now from that if you take all to all random interactions, you will get this, this uh, uh, highly entangled state of matter. Uh, without quasi particles, but you know, but how about if you take a, a a more realistic model? Of course, the difficulty is once you make it more realistic, it becomes impossible to solve. Uh, and so the you know people have studied kind of diluting the interaction, only putting interaction with a certain probability p, and and you find it still survives. Uh, so there is a very interesting suggestion by Marcel Franz that uh, if you take a flake of graphene then uh, uh, the randomness on the boundary of the flake is sufficient to put you in the SYK class. Now, we don't know that's true because uh, the, these non-random, these more realistic models are impossible to solve. So uh, so experiment has a role here. I'm, I think there are uh, experiments being planned to to look at things like Majorana fermions in random situations and see and see experimentally how, how wide the domain of SYK behavior is. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I'll take the other question. I'll just leave it. Uh, is there a measurement of this Planckian time in the ultra fast experiment, pump probe experiment? Because this time is quite accessible at crossover KBT. So, are there signatures of such a thing in a scattering exper in a time resolved experiment? I'm trying to think. I mean, there are. There's the work of. Peter Abomonte, this is low energy electron scattering. I'm not, yeah, I mean, that's not time resolved. Uh, uh, Peter Armitage also at Johns Hopkins has been doing some terror scale experiment. There are various measurements of in frequency space anyway of H bar over KT. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I think not so. Seen, I have not seen it. I was just uh, wondering whether yeah, yeah, I don't uh, have I missed so. anything. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands in Zoom, so I'll take now last question from the YouTube. Uh, it's by Kinshuk Sarkar. Can the random TJ model explain the fluctuation effects of the pseudo gap, uh, pseudo -gap physics, especially the fluctuation diamagnetism and the Nernst effect? Uh, great question. <laughs> uh, so the random TJ model does have a pseudo gap phase. Uh, this is the phase here, uh, and uh, and this, where was it? yeah, so this spin glass order, that's the pseudo gap phase. Uh, and uh, we are studying it, and we have various results of it, and it does have a pseudo gap, so it can certainly, uh, it, you know, explain certain uh, spin relaxation experiments and photo emission experiments, are, you know, does a pretty reasonable job. Uh, but something like the Nernst effect and fluctuation diagmatism, I think the spatial structure is really important. You're talking about transport in the Nernst effect and uh, effect of a uniform magnetic field. So I, I kind of doubt it will be able to at least even semi-quantitatively understand those effects in this model. Uh, but uh, yeah, but, but it does have what I consider to be you know the key features of the pseudo gap. Uh, one is, and the most important being that the density of carriers is P and not one minus P uh, and various signatures of that. Uh, and in the electron spectrum, the spin spectrum, and also in the photo emission spectrum. Thank you. Um, there are some, I guess the discussion can go on, but it's getting late and unfortunately we need to then come to a close. So let me thank Professor Subir Sachdev on behalf of IPA for a very interesting talk. And as it will be available offline, I'm sure many interested physicists will benefit further. I also take this opportunity to thank Professor Ramkrishnan, Dr. Amy Flatton, and Professor Spentawadia. And of course, thanks to all of you for being here on the late Saturday evening. I should acknowledge the technical assistance of Dr. Satyanarayan and Mr. Ravindra Shinde for this talk. And see you all next Saturday at 4 p.m. That will, next Saturday will be the concluding lecture of IPA 50 webinar series. It will be given by Professor Ashok Sen, whom we all know very well, distinguished professor from Harishchandra Research Institute. 
so see you next uh, saturday thank you and bye bye thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you very much thanks Shubhi. thank you very much thank you Oh, yeah, so yeah, recording can be stopped, yes. Thank you.